introduce myself. My name is Alex Gray, and uh, I am a, a geologist over here uh, at Sethi Petroleum, and uh, we are an oil and gas company uh, based out of Dallas. Um, we do a, a lot of drilling for oil all throughout North America, uh, specifically here in Texas, uh, kind of near you guys, and uh, up in North Dakota, so way up north. And um, my role primarily involves tracking all of our assets that we own and um, kind of assessing the value of stuff that uh, like we would like to purchase. So um, I guess you guys are, uh, you guys are heading through uh, studying earth sciences right now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Great. Well, uh, today we're going we're gonna to cover uh, topography. And uh, I'm going to kind of share with you guys a, a PowerPoint here. So uh, has anybody seen a, a, a topography map before? Does anybody know what topography is? Yes, sir. A little bit, yeah. So you guys kind of recognize what you're looking at here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. So um, hmm, let's, let's talk about what topography actually is. Uh, definition of topography is like the shape, relief, or roughness, uh, or any three-dimensional characteristics of the earth shown on a uh, two-dimensional uh, surface. So um, what, is, uh, like, what does that mean to you guys? Do you know what relief is? No. No? Well, relief would uh, sort of be like a mountain. Like imagine you had uh, a flat surface and you have like a big tall mountain sticking out. Um, have you guys ever seen one of those, uh, those old globes that you could feel all the mountains on it? Yes. 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 That's, that's essentially topography. That's, uh, I mean, that's relief right there. And uh, all the shapes of that and whatnot, that's uh, the characteristics of topography. And so let's get into some examples like uh, a mountain. Here's a uh, picture of uh, Mount Shasta, and you can see the, uh, the related topography image on the right. You can totally see it kind of looks like a 3D image almost, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, here's an example of a valley. So a valley is kind of a cool-looking thing. It's a little more complicated. You can see uh, over here, you can follow the river following uh, this path right here from the top of the mountain. Um, this is what a cliff would look like. A cliff is much more uh, uh, obvious feature on a Tobo map. Uh, kind of neat to see, actually. Um, what's another one? A volcano. A volcano is my favorite one to look at. Um, okay, so who knows how to uh, interpret a topographic map or uh, like how to actually read one or make sense of it? Have you guys ever had any practice with that? Yes, yes. yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay, so you guys know you guys know what contour lines are. Yes. Cool. Who can tell me who can tell me something about a contour line? What does that represent? Right in front of you. You? In the back. I think it means like the layers, like if it rises. Layers close, close. Um, a, a contour line essentially represents one level of elevation. So if you were anywhere along uh, that, that contour line, uh, anywhere on the map, you would be standing at the same elevation. And so contour lines um, uh, are gradual. So you have, um, well, all right, so yeah, we'll go into contour intervals. So on, um, on any topo map here, we'll go back to an example here. Um, you can see here there's about uh, five contour lines between each of those big 100-gradient uh, tick marks. And so for each one of those, that represents a 20-foot uh, a elevation change. You guys following? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Cool. So like here you can see in between uh, each of these, um, there's about, oh, man, I messed up there. There's 10 in between each. So actually the index contours on this one uh, should have been uh, 50 feet. That is my fault. So these are 10-foot contour lines on this example. Whoops, that's planning, you gotta plan. Uh, okay, another important uh, feature of topographic maps is the scale. You guys know what a scale is? Yes. What is a scale? Who can tell me what a scale is then? There in the blue. Um, it's basically like a tool that helps you like predict how far something is and how, like, how long something is. 
That's yeah. That's that's a good idea. So, um, does anybody know what the uh, the U.S. Geologic Society is? No. Heard of that before? Sure. Okay. Well, they're uh, they're I mean they're the main uh, geologic entity of uh, publishers throughout the U.S. Put on by the uh, Department of Interior, and so their standard scale that they use in their maps is one to twenty four thousand. So for each inch on a map that they produce, that's twenty four thousand inches in real life. Uh, pretty much 2,000 feet. So uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of detail represented in each little square uh, of those maps. Um, okay, what else is important on maps? Map location. Uh, why would why would map location be important uh, to to know? You in front. Anybody? Go ahead. Sorry, I can't see you guys super well. Yeah. So you can locate a place. True. So you can go to it. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? I mean, if you if you just had a map uh, without a location on it, what would you know? Like, like, what would it represent to you? Would it have any meaning, really? Well, no. No. Yeah. So we we have to know where these maps are. So uh, most maps that we have, um, or at least the maps that I use, they. Um, they, they have uh, like uh, latitude and longitude um, on either side. And so especially USGS maps, they'll allow you to, uh, to pick out lat latitude and longitude um, on either side, and you can use that to locate where you are. Um, what else might be important? Map symbols. Uh, do you guys, have you guys seen any symbols really besides contour lines? Or what else could be represented on a topographic map? You in front. A school. A school, yeah, buildings. Um, anybody else? You start throwing them out. A river. A river, yeah. Compass. Come on, any other ideas? Start saying them. Compass. A compass, yeah. A compass is a good, good tool to have. Come on, you. A major city. A major city, yes, yes, that would be important. Yeah. Um, other important things could be uh, we could have railroads. Uh, trails, um, gosh, what else? You could have uh, a really important one that I use when I'm in the field is uh, I'm looking out for um, looking out for caves and old mine shafts because you don't want to fall into those in the middle of brush. That would be extremely dangerous. Um, okay, so now you guys kind of understand uh, like the purposes of or how like how to interpret these maps. Um, you guys really know how to create them, though. Do you know all the all the processes in uh, like building a map? No, no, no. Okay. Well, that's where I come into play because that's what I went to school for. So, uh, do you guys ever heard of a, a topographic survey before, or any sort of survey? Well, I've heard of a survey. Survey. <laughs> survey. Well, yeah, you've heard those surveys, but you've heard of like a physical survey where uh, we actually send geologists and uh, surveyors into the, uh, into the real world to start recording data. Have you seen that before? I know most of you guys have. Yeah. 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 You guys recognize, um, you recognize that guy on the top left? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, those little boxes that they walk around with on the tripods, those are surveyors yeah. in modern life. And so that's a very important job for city planners. Um, you may think that they're just common road workers, but no, these guys are actually all engineers and they've uh, been highly trained to use these, uh, these uh, transit data, uh, or they're actually called total stations. And um, a total station can actually combine the compass, the GPS unit, and the mapping system all into one. It's a very useful tool. And so essentially, these guys go out and they'll pick a, uh, a location like we decided earlier. They pick a scale and then they record all this data into a centralized format. And it could either be a digital, uh, a digital database like through an Excel program or it could be through uh, like any paper just like data recordings on a satellite image they might have. From that, then uh, everybody has to um, interpret and apply the data to a two-dimensional format. And so uh, the USGS, like we said earlier, does that one to 2,000 foot scale. And um, what else do we do? Um, then we have to pick a, a medium. And so most of the USGS maps are all presented um, 
on the internet right now. You can get those from their website, but uh, they uh, their scale. Gosh, how many maps is it? I think there's 57,000 uh, maps that cover the U.S. right now. So that's quite a bit. Um, okay, so let's go back to geology and uh, let's talk about why topography map uh, why they're useful for us. And so here's some examples of um, gosh geologic events that have affected topography. And so I'm going to give you guys a few, and then we're going to work through a few more. I'm going to ask you guys some questions, all right? Yes, okay. sir. Okay, so you guys know what plate movement is, tectonics, right? Yes. Yeah, and so what can tectonics create? If plates are colliding and moving, like, what features can they create? Mountains. Mountains, yeah, good work, guys. Yeah, so here you can see we have some – well, on the left, we have mountains moving, but uh, those are those are examples of uh, deformation that can occur. Um, who who's seen uh, or who's seen a volcano before? Actually, that's a good question. You have that's pretty neat. So, <laughs> volcano is obviously a really good example of a topographic feature, and uh, we saw an example of one of those earlier, right? You saw it was like a big dome coming up, then you could see the depression in the middle. And so that's a, that's a useful tool for me. Um, what's another example here? Mudslides. This is a mudslide that happened this year, actually. Another cool example is um, streams and rivers. Has anybody been to uh, the Grand Canyon before? Yeah, so you guys know about the effects of streams and rivers and er erosion over time, right? Yes. Yeah, so the Grand Canyon is the best example of that. And remember, we looked at cliff faces earlier. And so the Grand Canyon is an example of like valleys and cliff faces. Um, and so you would see extremely sharp lines and like contour lines real uh, tightly spaced together on a map like that. What's another good example? So you guys, um, you guys have all heard of uh, deserts. You've seen sand dunes before, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, wind transport is a geologic event and um, uh, the building of dunes and dune slumping is um, a really important process, especially in uh, my business. I study, um, so I essentially study maps of old sand dunes and uh, coral reefs all the time. And so by being able to understand um, these on the surface, I can then apply that to subsurface maps, which is really neat for me. Um, then high energy erosion is another, uh, another earth event. Um, who, get, who remembers Hurricane Sandy? So Hurricane Sandy took away masses of massive amounts of earth from the beach and essentially um, totally eroded all that away. And so if you were to look uh, at a topographic map from before the hurricane and after, you would see everything, uh, all the contour lines uh, would have been uh, much lower. Um, okay, so let's change focus here. Who, besides me being a geologist uh, and studying these maps just as everyday work, um, who knows how a topographic map might be useful to somebody else? Um, who's seen uh, somebody use a topo map in real life? Uh, you in front in the blue. Um, well, I've never seen it, but like I've, I've seen like a TV show where like these historians try to find out like the continental drift and stuff, and they look at mountains and how they used to be like connected and stuff. Yes, that could be neat. Yeah, that that could totally be useful. Uh, in the yellow and back. Um, whenever people are trying to find the fossils. Yeah, you can do that. Archaeologists used uh, topography maps, and uh, they also they use those total stations like we uh, saw before, and uh, not only just for fossils but also for ruins. They'll use it to map out an area so when they start picking up artifacts they can uh, plant them on that, um, on that map, and then refer back to it later. Um, any other examples that you guys might know of? How about you on the left in the, the blue sweatshirt? Um, hikers. Hikers? Yeah, good one. So um, I actually, when I'm in the field, I, when I'm hiking and whatnot, I bring topography maps along with me, and I also bring my, uh, here, it's a neat tool. This is my my favorite tool that I have actually as a geologist. This is called a, uh, a Brunt and Compass. And uh, can you guys all see that? Yes, sir. Yeah, so a, uh, 
a brunt and compass is very useful for um, not only just for taking measurements in the field, but also if I want to triangulate where I am. I use my topography map to map out different peaks, and then I can actually position where I am, and then I can pick the easiest route with the most gradual slopes to go up different mountains and whatnot, so you don't get trapped on a cliff face. That's a, a very useful thing. Any other ideas? Yes, you? Construction workers. Yes, very good. Uh, being a geologist, uh, construction workers and I can work together, even though I commonly don't. But we will use topography and geology maps together to map out uh, uh, building uh, flat uh, foundations for their buildings and whatnot. And uh, that's, I mean, that's very useful in planning. Um, another, uh, another useful thing is also in the military, they need to use topography maps for uh, strategic planning. Uh, some of you guys maybe have heard that the higher ground, I don't know, is a strategic thing. So that's, um, that's something that was uh, very useful uh, throughout time. Also, um, another good example is um, uh, what you call it, seafarers. So, if you have a, um, if you're sailing the world, you need a topography map or at least a subsurface map to not run into any sand dunes or run your boat ashore. Um, gosh, yeah. So, I think that um, that concludes most of my presentation. Um, here, I wanted to show you guys these links right here. Um, I want you guys to write this down if you uh, if you can, because this top uh, this top link is to uh, the database uh, for the USGS of all the available topography maps that they've made of the U.S. and it's very useful. And now um, I'm going to open this up to you guys. If you guys have any questions for me, I'd like to answer all of them now. How did you know you wanted to be a geologist? Hmm. Well, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I had the Cascade Mountains and Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens in my backyard. And I was very interested uh, in all of those growing up, and I loved to hike. And I had to learn to use a topographic map uh, early on. And then when I was in college, I went to college at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and I learned about the oil and gas industry and how they were uh, they both could apply to each other. So... I mean, I guess I was a freshman in college when I decided that I wanted to be a geologist. What's the main thing you do in your job? Um, so for me, I, I work in a uh, like a an investment based uh, business now. So I work with a um, I work with a, a lot of finance guys who um, who are trying to invest money into uh, into oil and gas drilling opportunities. So I. Um, I essentially teach them about how you can uh, how you can do that and how you can get into uh, like really cool opportunities like that. Have you ever encountered a landform which you cannot map? A landform which I cannot map. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I have. Uh, but that is only because um, in my form of mapping, I have to take topographic maps and then I overlay uh, the geology of a region over them. And so in some instances, I've been so confused by a uh, really complicated situation in the field that I really didn't know what to do. But in a situation like that, um, I would come with my interpretation and my partners would come up with theirs and then we would, uh, we would combine our work together to come up with a solution for that. Um, how long have you been doing your job? Um, you know, this is uh, this is my first job out of school. I graduated uh, from SMU in uh, December of last year, and then um, I was an intern with this company throughout uh, my college career. And uh, yeah, so I, I picked this up as my first job. I've been doing this for about a year now. Without topographic maps, what would you use as your profession? Um, well, that's you know that's that's tough. Um, Hmm. Um, a lot of the stuff that I can use, I don't know if you guys have heard of seismic before, but do you know what a seismic map is? No. no. Uh, those are, I mean, a seismic is a, uh, it's essentially like an under, it's like a, it's a map of the subsurface. And those are some of, those are the most common tools I use now uh, in most of my day-to-day uh, -day work. So, you know, without topographic maps, though, it, it would be really, it would be really tough to do just about any of my day-to-day -day work because it really does uh, it really does come into play with most of my planning. What 
what college courses did you take to learn more about the topographic maps and about your job? Um, well, I took, uh, first I took a structural geology course, a sedimentary geology course, uh, your basic uh, course set of uh, everything basic geology uh, from crystallography to uh, igneous uh, petrology and whatnot. And then um, I took a series of field courses which brought you out into the field and taught you how to use that compass that I showed you guys earlier and how to take measurements in the field. And so after taking about three or four of those courses, I was prepared to go out and map uh, geology out in the field by myself. Uh, how many years in college did it take? Uh, college took me four and a half years, actually. I was lucky to get out of there before I stayed too long. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with taking an extra year, kids. <laughs> when was the first time that you learned about topographic maps? Uh, I want to say I was about your guys' age. Yeah. Uh, it was probably the first time I was going to go hiking or backpacking and really wanted to go out on my own. Um, uh, the most important one I looked at was um, for uh, Mount Rainier and uh, trying to plan a route to climb Mount Rainier, which was, uh, I mean, a very important process for me because you can get, uh, you could get isolated up there and that would be a bad thing. Um, how can an overhang be shown on a topographic map? An overhang, huh? Wow. That is, that is tough to say. Um, Hmm, that would be. I feel like you would have a uh, you would have a special a special feature drawn on it, but it would look much like a cliff. I would assume where all the contour lines would be tightly spaced together, and then there would be a uh, there would be kind of like a little I don't know an escarpment or like a monumental uh, feature drawn on the map that denoted that it was an overhang. What landform is the hardest to make a topographic map on? Um. I would say a complex river valley where there is um, lots of quick elevation changes and little uh, little spines. Um, here's a map actually. Here, um, I'm gonna hold this guy this up for you. Um, something like this. Can you guys see that? Yes, sir. So you see how there's lots of tiny little river features like that. Um, if I was to go ahead and do something like this out in the field. Uh, it would take me quite a long time to uh, to draw each of those little bits and make sure each of the contour lines followed the gradient perfectly. Um, that and also um, hmm, uh, to map correctly, I would also say obviously like a volcano or something wild like that. That would be real hard to map. Like I could not get down in there. Um, so you know how like most topographic maps are from a, like a bird's eye view of high. Yes. Is there a way that you can make one from like how you look at the mountain feature or whatever? Is there a way like from me looking at it, uh, like from bird's eye view? Do um, you mean like uh, if I was to take it from like a plane? Yeah. Yeah. So we do have that nowadays. It's called a uh, lidar, and so you have these uh, radar-enabled planes that can fly over at low altitudes, and uh, using satellite uh, GPS in the radar systems, they can record all the data for the topographic survey. Um, to go get the detailed data though, uh, sometimes people don't always rely on that. But uh, uh, aircrafts and drones are commonly used. Actually, they're starting to do that in um, Alaska as of last year. What investment firms have you been working with? Um, well, so we are a, a non-operational partner. So all the major oil companies you can think of, uh, we own, uh, we share uh, interest in wells with all of them. Um, as for major investment firms, uh, we don't necessarily deal with the bigger firms. We're more of a pr uh, private institutional side. So uh, we, we raise money from uh, small investors and um, like families. I don't know if anybody's family is like a doctor or something like that. Um, you know, they commonly want to invest with us in these uh, these joint ventures that we put together. How would you do a topographical map if there's a cave underground? Well, so uh, remember how I was telling you guys how there might be a feature on a map that would show the entrance to a cave or a mine shaft. And um, that would likely just uh, show up as just a small hole, actually. And uh, on a topographic map, you likely wouldn't see any of the cave or anything. Um, you would have to have a, uh, 
we'd have to have a detailed map set aside just for the subsurface of the cave, actually. What's the first thing that you do when you get a landform to map? Uh, first thing is scale. Scale is the biggest thing for me because I don't know how big or uh, I need to know what scale to think of and how to start imagining what I'm looking at. Um, and then I, after that, I'm going to look at the rock type so I can come up with a, uh, an evolutionary history of what we're looking at. And from there, we'll, uh, we'll start to break down the rest of the landform. How would you make like, a topographic map of like, Mount Rushmore a special place? Like, Mount Rushmore? Well, I would assume that Mount Rushmore would just appear as um, like a cliff, like we were showing earlier, because, uh, I mean, the... Well, I mean, if you had a very a very uh, low scale, so it was like a like a very uh, accurate uh, depiction of the area, you might see some features, but most likely it would just uh, appear as like a cliff with very tightly spaced contour lines. Uh, what's the biggest landform you've done a map on? The biggest man landform. Um, when I was uh, when I was studying in Italy last summer, I uh, I did a uh, I did an old volcano, and uh, it was maybe a, a 10 square mile map that uh, we were mapping. And I was mapping the uh, the tailings, the big slope. It was a volcano that uh, erupted up this way and kept on oozing down this way, so it made a big hill escalating down this way. How many landforms can you map at one time? At one time, wow. That is, um, I, I assume, depending on the scale of the map, it could be almost unlimited. Uh, uh, depending on, I guess, like the the, the geologic past of the uh, the region, you don't know how many landforms there could be. Um, but you could, I mean, you could start with a mountain, and you could have valleys coming down the side. Uh, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's a good question. It really depends on the the region that you want to map. Uh, so, what's where is the main place you uh, map? Um, well. Recently, I've been uh, working with uh, the Arbuckle Mountains in uh, Oklahoma and Arkansas areas. Um, mainly Oklahoma is where I've gone to practice most of my skills, though. How do you and who makes the maps? How do you? Wow. Um, okay, so like I said before, uh, we, have our, we have our various tools. Uh, my most common tool that I use is that Brunton Compass, uh, this guy and a GPS unit. And um, you, uh, you essentially start with a satellite image and um, you want to just start traversing across the area and taking as many data points as you can. And then once I've collected all that data, I can return back to the office. And um, I have a, uh, a software program that's kind of like uh, what they would use to make Google Earth. And uh, I use that software program to input my data into that. And um, after I do that, it'll produce a, uh, a rough draft of uh, like uh, the, the map I've uh, essentially, or the area I've mapped, yeah. How long does it usually take to map landforms? Hmm. You know, to accurately map an area, it could take you up to uh, a month, depending on how many times you might have to return to the area to, uh, to collect all the data that you really need. Um, when I was in school, we would commonly spend about a week on an area and uh, just move uh, slowly across the grid that we wanted to map. And then interpreting the data would take about a week longer also. Have you or do you think you'll ever make a topographic map of Mount Everest? Of Mount Everest, wow. You know, I think for that, uh, we would probably use planes. Uh, planes or... Um, Planes or maybe satellites, if we if we had the resources to do so, um, you know it, it it depends I guess on my funding for that. Um, ideally, I would like to uh, obviously climb the mountain and map it myself, but uh, that seems dangerous, and I don't think I can carry equipment up all the way up there. So um, I think I'm going to stick to the planes on that one. <laughs> so how many people does it take to map oh, one plane form? One landform. Uh, it could be as little as one, or as many as as many as you would like. Really, um, obviously, you want to work in teams when you're out in the field. So, uh, a team of three or more would uh, would be best for any situation like that. 
for other jobs that go with your profession? Yeah, with, you mean with my degree or with my profession? Just profession. My profession, yeah. So um, I could work with uh, a construction firm if I had to, uh, any sort of architectural firm. Uh, environmental consulting is another uh, high demand job for uh, right now. Uh, if I wanted to work out on the drilling rigs, I could also be doing that right now. Um, there's, I mean, there's plenty of applications. Um, I looked at being a forest ranger for a while, uh, just cause you would understand the, the region very well and how to map and get across the areas and whatnot. But yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there's, uh, endless options for applying my degree in my career. Like what is a normal day in your profession look like? A normal day in my profession. Um, I get to the office about 8 a.m. every day. Um, and uh, I start looking at prospects. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, drilling men out there that have their uh, their opportunities that they want you to uh, fund their uh, I guess their oil and gas drilling opportunities. So I start looking at uh, lots of seismic images and uh, well log uh, readings and whatnot. And uh, most of my day is dealing with landmen who are talking about who owns these properties and um, also dealing with the people who actually own them, talking to their geologists. And so I'm constantly, I actually have video conferences like this quite often just to uh, be able to explain and talk with guys about um, what they think they're seeing in the subsurface. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's my average day, I'd say. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Good luck with everything. And uh, Ms. Hall, thanks for the opportunity.